Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, kinichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are so happy that you're part of our Reading With Your Kids family. We absolutely love it. We have a fantastic guest for you today. It's time to celebrate reading with the folks at Scholastic. Mimosa Weber Bay is going to be here to tell us about Scholastic's Rita Palooza. Before we invite Demosa in, I want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is brought to you by The Nature Club, a series of nature-based books for middle grade readers by author and wildlife biologist Rachel Mazur. The Nature Club is made up of a diverse group of five friends. Each book in the series tells the story of one of the kids and, and how the kids approach a challenge of growing up. Now, these challenges include moving, parents divorcing, and health issues. Their stories each run parallel with stories about wildlife and the challenges wildlife face, including migration, metamorphosis, and foraging for seasonal foods. Each book ends with the kids finding ways to take simple actions to help themselves and the wildlife they love. Readers learn about the natural history of birds, monarch butterflies, bears, raccoons, frogs, and bobcats. And at the end of each book, there are discussion questions and a section on additional information about the featured animal. This is a great, great book, especially if you're looking to get your kids more connected with nature. For more information, you can find The Nature Club on Facebook or Instagram at The Nature Club Books or on the internet at natureclubbooks.com. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by No One Know Source by Elaine Kylie Kearns. Do you know someone who is a Noah source? Is your child a Noah source? Does your child ever have one of those days where they wake up and their answer to everything is no? Well, have I got a picture book for you. Noah Noah source by Elaine Kylie Kearns. Noah Noah source woke up feeling very no. No to brushing his teeth, no to eating breakfast, and definitely no to playing with his little brother. Things only get worse when Noah goes for a walk and discovers that the relentlessly cheerful Toby Rex, Brian Brontosaurus, and Ava Ceratops are following him. Together, the group starts a bonafide dino parade that even Noah cannot resist. This light-hearted, whimsical story will have readers laughing along at Noah and his friends, as well as their own bad moves. This hilarious book pairs two of kids' favorite things, saying no and dinosaurs. Adults can also relate to waking up on the wrong side of bed and feeling very no all day long. Noah Noah Source is available on Amazon and on Elaine's website, ElaineKylieKearns.com. And we also want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is brought to you by I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright. You know, if you're around kids these days, you may have noticed that many of them don't realize how very capable they are. Many children haven't had practice solving their own problems, and therefore they think that they're just not able to. Kids need to know that they are quite capable of handling situations they encounter in everyday life, and that they're capable of handling the emotions that come from those situations as well. Practice handling their problems is essential for achieving success in the real world. And we're talking about problems like missing shoes, having to turn the TV off, wanting a pet, or, or making a mistake. Kids learn best through repetition, and after reading this book and hearing the mantra, I can't handle it, over and over again, they will identify with the child in the story, and they will realize that they are just like him and declare to all that they can handle it. I Can Handle It is part of the Mindful Mantra series by Laurie Wright. You can learn more by going to her website, lauriewriter.com. Check it out today. I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright. Joining us right now from New York City. You have heard of her employer, no doubt, Scholastic. She is uh, one of the librarians for Scholastic, and she's here to tell us about a really amazing program Scholastic is offering and also some uh, pretty interesting information. Please welcome to the show, Demosa Weber Bay. Demosa, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? 
I am excellent. I'm real excited um, to have you on the show. Um, there's something Scholastic. Everybody knows Scholastic. They, uh, you know, they've been per- helping schools uh, raise money and and bring great books, and they publish great books. And um, but but if there's somebody out there that's been living underneath a mattress or mm-hmm. something like that, and they don't know what Scholastic's all about, can you give us a little thumbnail? Sure. Um, Scholastic is the largest publisher and distributor of children's um, materials, Mm -hmm. mostly books is what we're known for. Um, But we were founded in 1920 um, as the uh, Scholastic magazines originally. And then with time, we grew to include things like clubs where you get books through the mail, um, book fairs, where it's kind of like a pop-up store inside the school, mm-hmm. our education division, and, um, you know, several other parts of the company within the United States and across the, the globe, really. Yeah. 1920, I think I was like in uh, third or fourth grade back in 1920. <laughs> I, maybe not. I'm, I'm not sure. It might have been later. Anyway, so uh, – Scholastic has been part of uh, par- part of everyone's at this point, everybody's um, youth and growing up. Tell us about this great thing that's going on right now, the Scholastic Rita Palooza. Sure, the uh, Rita Palooza is our summer reading challenge program this year, and it's a program that pulls together students, teachers, parents, librarians, community partners, and booksellers in a movement kind of as an entire nation to try to get um, kids reading, reading for the fun of it, and getting books into the hands of uh, kids throughout the summer. And the reason that we're, you know, really excited about the Rita Palooza program ties directly into our Kids and Family Reading Report, where, um, you know, the section where we really did research looking at the summer reading experience, we found just, you know, an abundance of evidence that getting kids to read during the summer improves their educational outcomes and also just makes them a lifelong reader. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. What kind of um, information did you find in terms of who who are reading out there during the summertime, who's not reading, and how it affects their their learning? Well, one of the things that, you know, shocked us in particular looking at the research was that 20% of kids reported not reading any books at all over the summer. And, you know, that's fully one fifth Mm -hmm. of children that were responding. And within that as well, there's a term that we've, you know, known for a little while, but unfortunately not all parents are aware of yet, which is summer slide. Mm -hmm. And so summer slide, it is kind of, you know, like taking two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, where over the course of the summer, if a kid isn't practicing the habits that they got during the school year, they can lose some of the progress that they made. And so we found that 47% of our parents with school-age children didn't even know about the summer slide and how that can happen. And so, you know, we're trying to, you know, kind of also – address that kind of educational challenge that there is, as well as getting kids excited about reading for fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Th- that summer slide, that's something that uh, we've been aware about here in our, our family when, when our kids are growing up because my wife is a teacher. And oh. so we were, you know, every trip we probably drove our kids crazy because every every trip that we took, we made sure that we we had those workbooks, you know, going from second grade to third grade and fourth grade to fifth grade right. and all that kind of stuff. So we're on top of it. But, yeah, uh, I imagine that if you're not directly involved in education and you have one parent that's busy working one or two jobs or two parents and they're juggling jobs and they got all this other stress going on in their life. I, I, I imagine it can very easily, this, this kind of notion of the summer slide can really slip by them. Exactly. Yeah. What you, you said you were kind of surprised that 20% of kids reported not reading at all. I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I, I guess in this area, I'm a little, I'm disappointed that 20%, but I'm not, <laughs> I know. I'm not surprised by it because I, I don't think 
that we're putting enough emphasis or valuing reading as as much as I think we should. Um, I've seen statistics where you know there are you know maybe forty forty percent of adults don't pick up a book after they graduate high school or college. So you know a lot of kids they don't have that role model at home. They don't see somebody picking up a book or a Kindle or a newspaper and reading. Right. Right. And there's a lot of things, you know, competing for everyone's time these days. And so, you know, looking specifically at the summer as once you find that or once we find that parents are aware of the summer slide, then the actions that they take, you know, increase dramatically. And so the awareness part of just, you know, letting people know that something as simple as, you know, switching out some screen time for reading time could have a profound impact, you know, that builds up summer after summer. Um, most people, when they once they have that information, then they do something with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other side of the 20% is that, you know, 80% of kids are reading mm-hmm. um, during the summer. So that is, that's uh, encouraging as well. That's a, that's a real positive. So tell us, how does the Rita Palooza work? Oh, sure. So the Rita Palooza, um, in order to get to the Rita Palooza site, you go to scholastic.com slash Rita Palooza. And on that site, um, a teacher, a parent, a community partner, uh, somebody like a librarian, somebody who's um, working with a summer program, and a kid individually would be able to sign up to participate in the program. And once you're in there, there are activities, reading lists, and uh, different things, badges that you can earn during the summer. And then sometimes when people are reading in a group, whether they're with their class or they're, you know, kind of a summer program or something like that, you can kind of encourage each other, compete with minutes, um, you know, do different things like that as you go through so that everybody's kind of like reading and having fun together as an activity. And then beyond that, this year we're really excited because we have the opportunity for kids to help get books into the hands of other kids. Mm. And the reason that we did that is because we see that schools are the number one place where children have access to books. Mm -hmm. And so during the summer when the schools are closed, that number one place where kids have access to books and where they have choice, you know, the classroom library, the school library is no longer available. And so we're concerned about, you know, we're saying to everybody, you know, you should read during the summer. You should read the summer slide. Mm -hmm. But what if you don't, you know, have books readily available? Mm -hmm. And so this summer, kids who participate in the Scholastic Summer Read of Palooza, as they hit these big goals of 25, 50 and 100 million minutes, then Scholastic donates books to kids uh, through the United Way. That's fantastic. So kids can work together and add their minutes up, and that means that kids who have need have more access to books. Exactly. And, it you know, it plays on the kind of altruistic nature of, you know, children in this generation where they want to help others. And so not only are they improving themselves, you know, attacking the summer slide proactively, but they're also opening up, you know, doors to other kids um, mm-hmm. just through the act of reading. Mm-hmm. Now, th- that was fascinating that, that you folks found that 20% of kids aren't reading at all during the summertime. What other kind of information did, uh, did the survey, did the report kind of uncover? Well, we act, the report has a, a few different sections to it, and the section with Summer reading, we were really looking specifically at the, um, like the, specifically looking at the ways that kids are accessing books during the summer, the uh, choices that they're making about how to spend their time with the books that they have during the summer. And then in some of the other sections of the, um, I think even within that, we have the kind of if they knew about a summer reading program and participated in it. Versus if they read alone on their own without participating in a program. Mm -hmm. And then um, we found things like 70% of kids say that they love summer reading because they get to read whatever they want 
mm-hmm. whenever they want, mm-hmm. as opposed to kind of the homework assignments that you might have in school associated with reading. That um, 53% of the kids said it was a fun way to pass the time. So that was encouraging mm-hmm. that people still see reading as a fun, you know, it still ranks up there with all of the thing, other things that compete for time. Mm-hmm. And that more than half of kids said that they enjoy reading over the summer. So that number is shocking for us because it's hard, you know, being a reader myself to imagine a kid not picking up a book during the summer. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we do find that most kids are still enjoying reading during the summer. And it's just a matter of trying to get that number whole. Mm-hmm. Tell me, as a librarian, as someone who's involved with Scholastic, who and in, in, in a company that's so involved with reading, encourage kids reading, what kind of benefits uh, can can kids can families get from spending time reading together? Well, it's definitely a bonding experience that can create you know those positive memories mm-hmm. that go back um, over time in um, the read aloud section of our report. I don't have the number in front of me exactly, but I know that there are things like kids really enjoy when their parents do voices Mm -hmm. and then parents really enjoy like doing voices for their children. So you also create those kind of like moments of laughter and stuff like that um, between families and between the generations. And then as kids get older, the way that you read, together as a family can change. Mm-hmm. So it can go from, you know, read aloud story time where the parent is made, you know, kind of more directive reading out loud to the kid to a situation where the children are reading out loud to the parent. And then it can even move to, you know, quiet time where everybody in the family is reading, you know, quietly together or road trips, you know, where everybody's listening to the same thing together in the car and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So as the family kind of grows together, the way that you read together can change and grow. And as parents, you know, you're modeling for the your children the habits of a reader. Yeah, absolutely. Those, you know, you brought up some things that bring up some great memories for me doing voices for my kids. And uh, I think the hardest, as a performer, doing voices was really easy for me. Uh, what was very difficult was remembering what voices I had for which characters because if I changed them when we read the book again, right. and they'd be very upset. And they're no, no, that's not the voice. And I'm like, well, I don't remember what I did. So, and and I think it's I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned how our reading together can evolve and should evolve as a family, as the kids are growing and becoming more independent readers and. And, and just reminding parents that that's it's still really valuable for us to spend our time reading with our kids, and uh, if not allowed, then then co-reading and talking about uh, what we're reading together, and uh, listening to books on tape and talking about that. It just you know, there's just so many benefits, and and you were mentioning that bonding time. That to me is the most important. I I often say that uh, you know. Uh, reading is the, is the foundation for a lifelong conversation we can have with our kids. Right. I mean, one of my fondest memories from childhood, you know, certainly is my dad, who's the, the reader, the kind of fantasy science fiction mm-hmm. reader that he turned me into. And I remember him reading um, stories from A Thousand and One Nights mm-hmm. sitting on the floor when I was a kid. But that evolved into when I was older as a teenager he would put the Batman comic book down on the table and he'd just slide it across to me and tell me, read this so that we can discuss it. (laughs) (laughs) And then, you know, yeah, then I would read, you know, Batman Nightfall or, you know, one of the kind of iconic ones. Um, And then we would talk about, you know, whether or not it was realistic and, you know, what could have happened differently and all that kind of stuff later. And so that's how, you know, my reading relationship with my father has morphed from him reading out loud to me to now, you know, he would pass me books. And now me working in a children's publishing company, I'm often passing, you know, books to him and telling him, you know, you got to read this so that we can talk about it. That's awesome. <laughs> and I, I love that your father, and, and this is something I've mentioned it so many times on the podcast, but 
I, I have to own it, and uh, because it was a you know a mistake that I made as as a dad was not realizing that reading comics and reading graphic novels that's reading, and yeah. and it's valuable reading. And I didn't you know I. I didn't pro- prohibit my kid from reading books, but I would oftentimes go into my son and go, could you please read a book that, that doesn't have a picture in it, please? And, uh, and I just didn't give, give him the credit, and I didn't understand that, that, a, that a lot of graphic novels and comics have really deep uh, plots and very complicated Absolutely. stories. Yeah, I mean, and what, it's really exciting right now what's going on with comic books and graphic novels, especially in the children's space. And there's a lot, particularly, you know, being a librarian, looking at nonfiction, there's a lot of nonfiction top, nonfiction topics that are being uh, tackled by graphic novels. And, so, you know, obviously I'm thinking of some of ours, like the ones by Raina Telgemeier, Smile and Sisters, and she's got the one um, coming, I think, in the fall. Cuts. And those are each memoirs that are about, you know, experiences that she had uh, growing up, um, there are a lot of biographies and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, a lot of the, um, the the kids can actually log minutes for, you know, comics when they're uh, participating in summer reading. So I want to make sure that they know that they absolutely count. Comic books and graphic novels always count. And, um, you know, our graphics imprint is really a place here where we're getting to see the enthusiasm, like the raw enthusiasm, um, especially between the ages 8 to 12, where a lot of our um, graphic novels are kind of aimed. Mm-hmm. When we look at the um, the Kids and Family Reading Report, we often see that, you know, after age 8, eight 9, you know, I think it uh, decline at 9 is the, you know, one of the phrases that's in an earlier part of the report. And, you know, if, if it's maybe something as simple as trying out a different format that would hook the kid who may, you know, be on the path to declining as a reader, mm-hmm. then I say go for it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they have good reading levels. You can always look up the Lexiles and the different grade levels, letters, um, whatever um, the school might be using as a measurement and stuff like that. And there we have, um, we, do, we actually have a booklet online that's about using comic books and graphic novels in the classroom that can help, um, you know, if a teacher or a parent is trying to make a case. You know, there's still definitely folks out there that need um, proof. And so we do have a document that we can share with you guys. Excellent. That kind of makes the case for using them in the classroom as educational objects as well. Wow. If, if, if only I had my hands on that, on that report when my, when my son was in middle school. It would have saved us um, some battles, I think. Um, what do you think, what is it you think that, that is so attractive to, why, why are kids so attracted to graphic novels, do you think? That's a great question. And definitely a bit of it is, you know, a lot of people are visual learners. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually don't want to, you know, use the phrase visual learners as if, um, you know, that they don't have other ways to learn, Mm -hmm. but, um, there's something, the kind of grammar of comics that folks may not necessarily recognize, but most of us are familiar with if we think about the anger lines, the speed lines, you know, when somebody is running. Mm-hmm. And in particular, the facial expressions that people draw in comics can be used when we're talking about things that have to do with empathy and, um, you know, recognizing other people's feelings and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot yeah. of exercises that you can do where you kind of and like look across at all of the different types of faces. Um, in fact, Raina Telgemeier's, um, I know I mentioned her earlier, but she's also got a book out called Share Your Smile. And it's, a, it's kind of a book about drawing comics and graphic novels. And within there, she gives, you know, different kind of um, tasks and activities and challenges that somebody who's really enthusiastic about drawing um, might be interested in. And, um, you know, it really does, there's, for some reason with the graphic novels, it really inspires kids to try to create their own. Mm-hmm. We know that fan fiction is a thing, but if I can, it's hard to even count, you know, how much um, uh, kind of that Dave Pilkey has inspired mm-hmm. the Captain Underpants. Yeah. You know, with uh, yeah. kids that are drawing their own comics and basically being George Beard and Howard Hutchins themselves, you know, making comics and sharing them. 
in the playground, in the classroom with their friends. And that is the kind of kid that Dave Pilkey was. Mm -hmm. You know, he actually did make comics and pass them around and get in trouble for it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and here we are full circle later. And, you know, there's research you know, that shows the educational benefits, you know, that kids get from reading things like Captain Underpants yeah. and Dog yeah. Man. Yeah. I have two great Dave Pilkey um, memories. One was not Captain. My, my son was a major Captain Underpants fan, and I actually dug it. And that's one of the books that we read together aloud because it was so much fun to read. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Was, I love the Flipperama. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But the, but w- the, my first introduction to Dave um, was a book he wrote called Dogzilla, and oh, yeah. and that was one of the first books that I remember reading to my son. It wasn't the fir- I don't think it was the first book, but it was the first book that he fell in love with. And I remember p- playing Dogzilla and making those noises in, the, in those voices that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and, and the yeah. other the other memory was um, last year in Panama, going into where else would I go, but I visited a bookstore down in Panama City, and what was prominently displayed in the children's section was Captain Underpants in Spanish. So so it was great to see that kids in Central America liked Captain Underpants just as much as kids here in the States. Absolutely. And, you know, for kids who are still, you know, processing language and stuff like that, the left to right, you know, action that you have with comics is the same kind of thing that you have with reading. They are making inferences and drawing conclusions, you know, like I said, off of the grammar that's, you know, different than our grammar, but the laugh lines, the anger lines, lines, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they can be incredibly, incredibly useful, especially to try to hook the people who might be um, striving readers. I was going to ask, is, is this something that you f- that you find is really helpful with reluctant readers? Yeah, and and you notice I was trying to use the term striving readers okay. because I don't I'm just trying to like stick on the positive side because uh-huh. the you know reluctant reader it could be that they just haven't run into the book that's for them yet. So in the I'll be real quick with this, but in the um, the laws of library science, there are five laws of library science. Uh, the first one is books are for use. And then the second and third one, which I always confuse, is um, one is a book for every reader and the other one is a reader for every book. And so the idea being for every book, there's somebody out there who will enjoy that book. Uh-huh. And then for every reader, there's a book out there for them somewhere. And so your job as the librarian is to try to connect the books, you know, to the right readers. Well, I'm, I feel really lucky today because not only am I finding out about Scholastic's Rita Palooza, but I also, and, and I'm, I'm very sincere about this, I love that term, striving readers. And, and, you know, I came, I started doing this podcast. It was a, I was going in a different direction. All these consultants said, no, you should do a podcast about this. And I was going in that direction. And then just at the very last minute, I just remembered how important reading was in our family, and I decided, yep, no, this is the way I'm going to go. And I've learned yeah. so much. And uh, this striving reader, I do, I like that so much better than reluctant reader. Yeah. In, in a, lot, a lot of times I'm trying to think about ways to, to you know, it's, even when we were talking before about the 20%, we're like, but the 80% right. are reading during mm-hmm. summer. I'm like, mm-hmm. a lot of people read. Absolutely. And so, you know, yeah, you know, and so far this summer, you know, we've got about a half a million or more kids that are signed up for the Rita Palooza Summer Reading Challenge. So, you know, hopefully those kids are reading graphic novels and comic books as well as listening to audio books, you know, all of those different things. Count. Yeah, absolutely. And we hope, I don't know if we're going to get a, a half a million people who listen to you and listen to this podcast that are going to sign up, but we're really hoping that a whole lot of folks sign up. Remind everybody, please, where they can go to sign up and be a part of Scholastic's Rita Palooza. Sure, absolutely. Well, they go to scholastic.com slash Rita Palooza, which is R-E-A-D-A-P-A-L-O-O-Z-A. And so far, you know, we've hit 50 million minute mark and so i can report back that we've unlocked two book donations so now we're hitting the month of july and 
everybody's for the most part out of school on the east, west, north, mm-hmm. south coasts of the country. And so we're looking to hit that 100 million mark. And once we have 100 million minutes read, Scholastic's going to have, um, we'll be able to donate 200,000 books hits through the United Way. Awesome. That is fantastic. Well, if, if for no other reason, get your kids to sign up for the Rita Palooza so we can get all those books into the hands of needy kids. We've had exactly. such a great time speaking tonight to um, the librarian at Scholastic, the company that supports Yay. so many libraries, Demosa Weber Bay. Demosa, thanks so much for being part of our show. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Lisa Caprelli. She is the author of Unicorn Jazz. You know how much kids love unicorns. I remember my daughter had a stuffed animal. It was a unicorn. She called it Uni the Unicorn. And she slept with it all the time. And if she went away, she went away to someone else's house. And she wouldn't bring it with her. But, but she would call home and make sure that I slept with it. So I'm really excited to have Lisa Caprelli come in and tell us all about Unicorn Jazz. Hey, if you are the author of a great children's book, you may have been surprised to find out that once your book is published... That's when the real work starts. It's time for you to become the marketing director for your book. Well, we have a great program that will really help your book stand out from the crowd of books that are published every single year. It's called the Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Program. We have assembled a team of evaluators, their, their parents, their kids, their teachers, and if they think that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read. And with that distinction comes a, a number of different tools that can really help your book stand out, really help you promote your book. You can learn more about it by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author services button. We'll tell you all about it. We want to thank the folks who made today's show so possible. Demosa Weber Bay from Scholastic. Make sure you check out Scholastic's Rita Palooza. Help your family have so much fun, and in doing so, help other families too. We also want to thank our sponsors, Lori Wright. Make sure you check out I Can Handle It. Rachel Mazer, her her Nature Club book series is a wonderful, wonderful series for middle grade readers. And of course, we want to thank the author of Noah Noah Source, Elaine Kylie Kearns. I want to thank my producer, Fatima Khan, for all she does. Make sure you check out her blog on our website, readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support that she gives me. And of course, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us. And thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.